Bueno, empezamos. Hola, chicos y chicas. So, sorry, I have to continue in English because my Spanish is so-so. <laughs> but in private, we can talk some Spanish maybe later. And if you haven't heard, so there are some stickers, so maybe not now, but after the talk, you can take a sticker of uh, Java Duke, like this guy here. Um, okay, so today I want to give you a guide of how you can design a clean architecture. First of all, a few words about myself. My name is Markus Biel. I'm a clean code evangelist, and besides lots of other stuff, I do work as a clean code coach and a Java consultant. Okay, enough about myself. So, now let's assume we're all a big team of developers, right? We're agile, so that's probably the best size for an agile team. And you try to talk about the architecture of your system. From my personal experience, we usually do so by standing in front of a whiteboard. So for this purpose, let's assume this is our whiteboard now. And what I usually see is when we discuss the architecture of a system, we stand there and we see these boxes here. And I think this is quite simple. And I made this quite simple on purpose because that is what I, on average, see. A very simple overview of an architecture that looks very simple. Well, if it is so simple, I guess that is a clean architecture on a very high level. So it seems like we can go. We all know how to implement a clean architecture. We're done. Well, unfortunately, the reality is a bit different. <laughs> it's a big bowl of mud, many, many connections. It's really hard to reason about the architecture. Like before, we could see that something is starting here, something else is starting here without knowing any details. And we're seeing that the process, whatever it is, ends here. But this is not possible here. We have many cycles. It's really hard to reason to talk about the architecture. So why is it that like, we discuss this when in reality the architecture looks like that. For this I see two reasons. First of all, well, this might be a matter of the level of abstraction, right? On a very high level, this might be the truth. But, I mean, an architecture is more than just this high level. An architecture is everything, all the fine details. So I think to me this is more like a lie. The reality is like this, we have to face the fact our architecture looks like this. So, something went wrong. And the question is also, like, why did this happen? Like, I think this is also a matter of time. The architecture might have started like this initially, because when we start a new project from scratch on the green field, well, everything is simple. We have just a few features, and we spend a lot of time thinking, like, how can we design a nice, clean architecture? So we come up with that at the beginning. So in the beginning, this might have been true. But then there is the business people, the smart people, and they, their job to add new, more features to our backlog, right? We're agile. So they add more and more features, and we have to implement them sprint by sprint. We don't have much time. So the idea that we initially had was never enforced. And so it seems like always we end up in this mess. So this obviously is not a clean architecture. But unfortunately, to my experience, that is what the average architecture looks like. So I think here we can already see one thing. First of all, what we have to get right, we have to enforce that it's not possible that we, from here, end up there. I'll, I'll show you how we can do this in the next slides. Second, I think we can see that, I mean, that is an architecture. It is about boxes, and it is about the connections between these boxes. So it seems like we have to dig deeper there. We have to see, like, what is this all about, these boxes and these connections, and how can we get that right? Okay. To me, that topic is all about a modular architecture. Modularity. This is really the key here. We have to get a clean, modular architecture to get this right. And to illustrate this, I brought you this image here of this little boy playing with Lego cubes. One Lego cube obviously doesn't do much. But putting many Lego cubes together makes this concept super powerful. It is simple enough, 
that this boy can play with Lego cubes, but it's also powerful enough that adults can play with Lego and we can build up statues a few meters high. The concept is so powerful that it made the Lego company a multi-billion dollar company, so there seems to be something. Modularity, we can also call it divide and conquer, right? I mean, I'm not so picky with words, so for me that's just the same thing, right? That is how we humans solve problems. Divide and conquer, we take a very complex problem and we split it up into smaller subunits and then each subunit again until it is easy enough. I mean, I'm sure you know about that, but that's the thing that we have to get right, okay? And if we look at a programming language like Java, we will also see that Java itself and any kind of modern programming language itself is modular to the core. Now you can argue with me and say, hey, but that is just layers. Well, layers, again, I'm not picky with words. To me, it's just the same thing. It is a way of how we split up complexity to make it better digestible because we humans have a problem with that complexity. So now in Java, we have methods. Oh, one sec. There. It's coming, yeah. We have methods, we have classes, we have packages, and now, hooray, with Java 9, finally, we even have modules, right? Modules even has the name for modularity. So in my talk, to differentiate, differentiate between the abstract concept and Java 9 modules, I will say, I will speak of components or units when I mean the general concept, and when I say modules, I specifically will speak of Java 9 modules, okay? So, we can see here something else. We can see that every module consists of packages, and every package, again, uh, consists of classes. And every class usually consists of methods. So the smallest units matter the most. The smallest mo units are the ones that occur the most in our system. So those we have to get clean in the first place. Achieving a clean architecture is not simple, and Obviously, we have to get everything clean. That's the thing. I mean, we also have to get the packages and the modules clean. But the small things are the ones that we should look at first. And not, I mean, I think very often the problem is that we're just approaching the architecture high level, too much high level, and we forget about all the small details. Okay, so now let me give you a sneak peek of what we're trying to achieve in the very, very end of this talk. So within this talk, I'll give you some building blocks that you need to achieve a clean architecture. But now let's just assume we, we are already there. Um, and now you're back in the office and you want to implement my ideas and you want to implement the clean architecture. And when you want to implement such a clean system, you have to start with some architectural pattern, some architectural approach. So there are several ones available. For example, you would know Model View Controller. One that I really like to achieve a clean architecture, and what, one that I would really recommend you to look at in detail, is hexagonal architecture. If you already know about hexagonal architecture, that's great. That will help you to get a deeper understanding of my talk. But it's not required to understand the talk because I will give you the bare minimum needed right now. Okay, so what is this about? First of all, hexagonal architecture, like any kind of architecture, is a layered architecture. Right here, we can see two layers. We can see the infrastructure layer and the domain layer. So, yes. So now the question to me is, like, how can we ensure that this really nice looking picture will not end up like this again, right? Because this is just our promise. It looks super nice, but who, how can we ensure that we don't end up again in this mess? And to me here, the answer is Java 9 modules. We can make each layer, in this case we have two, a Java 9 module. And this way we can encapsulate how we want the system to be used. In this case, the dependencies are going from the outside in. That means the infrastructure layer, this is the technical details, they know about the domain. But the domain will know nothing about the infrastructure. And I think that's very important here also, specifically, because the domain, that's everything like we're actually paid for, right? You work in a specific domain in a specific business. They want you to solve a specific problem. Obviously, it's a, like an evil need to have infrastructure. We need that. But 
the clients would not be interested in something like a database, right? They want just their problems to be solved. So it's really a good idea to like, keep these two things apart because they will change different times for different reasons. And I also like hexagonal architecture a lot because it's very friendly to, to domain-driven design. This is also why the inner core is called domain. So this is what the domain as in domain-driven design. I don't know if you know about domain-driven design. I hope so. Again, if not, it doesn't matter. I'll tell you everything you need within the talk. But again, I would highly recommend you to read about domain-driven design. There is this famous book from Eric Evans. It's not an easy read, I have to admit, but the content is really gold. And once you have understood this, this is not so hard, and I will come to the important parts within my talk. Okay, so to repeat, hexagonal architecture is a layered architecture. We will use Java 9 modules to keep these two layers apart and to enforce that this is never going to happen. Second, here, the cool thing is we have the technical details and the domain separate. So the domain is totally agnostic of all the technical details. And third, I might quickly mention, like, I know everyone loves microservices, right? By the way, we might do a poll. So who of you is already using microservices? Okay, that's a lot. And who, like, would like to use microservices? of the ones that ha is not using microservices. There is even more. Yeah, so we all love microservices. But personally, to me, as a clean coder, microservices are just a tool, right? They can be used for really great things, but they come with some added amount of complexity. And when it comes to complexity, I really have zero tolerance. I really have to ask myself, do I need this, right? And if I don't need it, I will go for the much simpler solution, and I will go for a monolithic architecture and not for a microservices architecture. So I put this here just to make you happy that you see like this is possible to scale up my concept, my idea. You can also scale this up to a microservices architecture. But be careful with that, because don't solve problems of another company, right? But let's just assume you are Google. In this case, you could scale this up then each domain-specific service would be its own microservice, and they would communicate over something like REST. So the blue hexagon that you can see here would just be another microservice. So this is possible. I would just try to avoid it whenever possible. Okay, so let's go on. Okay, so now I come actually to those building blocks. And this is just a very small selection, because the topic clean architecture is really a big one. And our time is quite short. There is 36 minutes left. So I couldn't tell you everything, I'm sorry. So just to give you an idea what I'm not talking about today, or only now quickly, the first thing would be like all the social topics. Everything that I tell you now is going on the assumption that you are like working in a good company and a good team that people listen to you, that you can make changes, that you are allowed to refactor the code. I know that is not always easy. But the thing is, like after my talk, often people come to me and tell me, these are great ideas, but when I'm in my team and I tell them about that, they will not listen. Well, if they not listen, you will not be able to do that. I will have the exact same problem. So this will be the condition. And this is why Getting that social thing right. I mean, we're developers. We, we just want to focus on all the technical details, right? But first and foremost, we have to get these social topics right. And this is really very important, and we should remember that. I wish I, I wanted to actually talk about that, but I did a survey on Twitter, and people <laughs> were much more interested to hear about architecture, so now I'm sneaking this in a bit <laughs> to remind you, please get this right. It's, it's really important. We are not on ourselves. We are working in a team, so this is only working if the team is working. Okay. So, but I will not talk about this today. <laughs> and the second thing that I will not talk about is testing. Testing, and when I say testing, is, uh, I mean unit testing, is super, super important to achieve a clean architecture. But testing is so important and so big, I would do our own talk only on that. So. Sorry, I will also not talk about testing. But just to skim also this topic. 
when I speak of unit tests, the fact that I will be able to find the bug, to me, is just a side effect. I use tests on the first case as like an indicator to show me, is my architecture, is my system still testable, is it still understandable, maintainable? If it's not testable, then it's not clean. So I will try to achieve a very high level of branch coverage. And only when this, that is possible, I know I will have a clean architecture. Sorry. If I have a problem achieving a high coverage rate, I know something is wrong and I will try to fix it. OK, but as I said, I will not speak about this. So now, let's come to the stuff that I will actually talk about. And the first thing is size. OK, so when I say size, obviously I speak of small size. Size is like focusing on, on small size, small components, small units is really great. Because to me, this is like a pragmatic approach, an upside down approach to achieve a clean architecture. Because as you'll see, all the other building blocks that we will talk about, they're very hard to achieve, to get them right, because it's always about managing complexity. And complexity, I mean, the word says it, is complex, so this is not easy. But small size is about simplicity. And that's obviously the opposite of complexity. So getting things small, simple, is the first and most important thing, because this will make everything much more easy. We don't have to get rid of complexity that is just not existing. So I would really ask you to keep your methods, classes, packages, and modules small. And in this case, I would again use size as an indicator, as a tool to show us like a smell indicator is something wrong or not. For this reason, I would recommend you to, in your team, to define an upper limit for methods, classes, and all these. And the exact number doesn't matter, but just to give you one number that I would use, for example, for a class, maybe 50, 60 lines. Now, you can and, uh, disagree with me. That, that's not the point. Because the number, the specific number, doesn't speci uh, really imp uh, is not as important. It's just an indicator that when you have a class that is bigger, check, like, is it still testable? Is it still maintainable? Is it still readable? If that's the case, that's fine, you know? What I really don't like that often we put up rules in our teams and then we try to blindly, like, like a slave, follow these rules. And then we like, shoot people if they don't follow that rule. <laughs> That's not how I think this should be done. This should be always, we should always stay pragmatic and simple. Because our goal is not to achieve a certain component in a certain size. This is just a way to get there. Our goal is to achieve a clean architecture, maybe, but first of all, actually, it's to make our clients happy, right? So we should look at this goal and not forget about this goal and not focus too much on those small things that get us there. So size is just an indicator to get there. It's not the like, final thing that we want to achieve. OK, so now I want to talk about naming. Naming is at least equally as important as size, I think. And naming, obviously, is hard. If we have a clean name, like let's say customer, well, what would you assume a component called customer will contain? Well, probably customer-related logic, exactly, thank you. Account number, same thing. But what about a component called general utils? Well, general is something, right? And utils is helping with something. So general utils is something, something. <laughs> and if you are honest to yourself, I'm sure you have implemented such a component before. Well, I have, <laughs> right? <laughs> there, thank you. And we do that, and we think, oh, you know, just five minutes, and I have to go, and the sprint uh, is done, and I really have to push it, and this will not hurt. I will just call this general utils, no one will see it, and I will fix it. Yeah, I will fix it. Next sprint, I will fix it, I promise. <laughs> yeah, and then we never do, and then this grows. And that's the thing, because Two months later, the next colleague, and that might be yourself, looks for some new code to live in. Let's say this is car-related logic. I love, car is always my example. <laughs> so if you look for a place for this car-related logic to live in and you have, see general utils, the first thing that you'll see is not the code. The first thing of a component is the name. And general utils seems to be the perfect place for my car-related logic. So let's put it there. 
And oh, next thing, bike-related logic, let's put it there. And so such classes, they will grow and grow and grow. And they will be totally, totally dirty, and they will be totally of low cohesion. We'll talk about cohesion later on. So this is why names are so important. They have to be very, very specific. And this is also why, like, I would ask you to be very careful with the service pattern. I mean, I do use the service pattern, so something like a car service is obviously much better than general utils, right? But still, like car service, what does it do? Let's think about this. Well, it's a service for cars. So what service could that be? Let's say creating a car, destroying a car, buying a car, renting a car, selling a car, painting a car, you name it. And isn't that, from our experience, again, exactly what happens? So the service classes grow over time as well, a lot. So next day when you're back in the office and you want to spend some time to look for some code that might need some improvement, have a look at your service classes. Because these classes, from my personal experience, are usually the ones that are a few hundred lines long. And those are the classes that you can split up and make smaller and simpler. And you obviously have to do this continuously over time because like it's about like shaping our bodies. If we don't do this every day, we will sooner or later get a bit bigger, let's say it like this. <laughs> okay, so, and next, clean names are team name, uh, teamwork, sorry. This is closely related now to domain-driven design. This is what in domain-driven design is called the ubiquitous language. That word <laughs> to me is totally unclean because for me, as also a non-native English speaker, ubiquitous <laughs> took me very long to be even able to speak out, especially on stage. I mean, but the concept here is super simple. It's only about a clean, simple name, a common language that people use in a team, that everyone has a common understanding about. That, and when I say team, I mean everyone. The managers, the developers, the clients, everyone in the team. You have to use that common language in your code, in your documentation. I hope you don't have too much documentation, but that's also another topic. At the coffee machine, when you talk to your partner, in the middle of the night when you dream, this is the language that you should use, right? Yeah. And that obviously is not easy. You will not get this right. You will not get this right instantly. So you have to, whenever you get a new insight, you have to refactor, you have to rename your components. I would even guess this is so hard that you will never perfectly get it right, which is also okay, but you should just you know, continuously work on that, improving that. This is also, again, related to social topics because this is related to fear. Oh, I fear to touch the code, they will punish me. So again, <laughs> this only works if you have a standing in your team and you're allowed to touch the code, and if you uh, dare to touch the code. Okay, but this is so important because obviously touching something is difficult and is dangerous, but not touching it is even more dangerous. Okay, so. And now I want to talk about encapsulation. What is encapsulation? That's actually quite an interesting question. So, here's my definition of what encapsulation is, because I asked many developers and there was, there is many different definitions of that. So my definition of encapsulation is, it's the implementation of information hiding. So it is again about simplicity. And that means it's also about abstraction, right? We're hiding certain things to make it simpler, better digestible, the complexity for us humans. Now this again is something that we humans need. Computers don't have a problem with complexity, we humans do. And the great thing about encapsulation is also, it technically enforces of how the system should be used. That's what I said initially in the talk, right? So when we are on a module level, for example, encapsulation helps us to define rules that are enforced by the compiler of how we want the system to be used. And when we violate this rule, the compiler will tell us this was wrong. <laughs> and this is very helpful for us, right? because otherwise we will never follow these rules because we humans make mistakes, we tend to forget, the complexity is just too much for us. And there, encapsulation helps us a lot. When I started learning about Java, that was about 2001, so a few years ago, 
I read in a book that encapsulation was about getters and setters. That was interesting. <laughs> um, to be honest, I really never understood it. And this really troubled me for years. Like, why is that about encapsulation? Well, it took me a while to understand. The reason why I never understood this made, made sense, because this is really doesn't make sense. <laughs> and I don't know if you agree. Some, some might disagree. If you do, here I've put a link where you can read more about getters and setters and why I think they are evil. So this is really, again, a big topic. I think there's 10 pages, so here will only be quick why I think we should not use getters and setters. Well, the thing is about encapsulation, right, on a class level. We have our attributes. We make them, for example, private because we don't want them to be used directly. We want to think in functionality. We want to program object-oriented. And we don't want to think in data. That's why we encapsulate. That's why we hi hide these fields. But now if you provide getters and setters, isn't that totally countering the whole idea? Because you can directly now access and even modify the field. So that's just the same thing as making this field public. And if you have a simple, stupid DTO that you don't use much, it might be even OK to make the field public. In any case, before I would just use a stupid getter and setter, I would think about can I make this field public instead? Because then at least the code is simpler. It's not nice. Obviously, it hurts. It is a violation, but it is a smaller violation than even adding more code to allow that. OK. So, um, and the last thing I want to talk about in the sense of encapsulation is package and private. Package and private is really an awesome visibility modifier. And unfairly, we hardly ever use that. Why is that? Well, it is so because package private is there when we don't put any visibility modifier. So, and when we do so, the next developer will never be sure. Was that on purpose? Is that really meant to be package and private? Or was that just forgotten? So, if you use package and private, please add a comment at the why. Why do you want this to be package and private? Um, as I, I think said before, I'm not a big friend of a lot of documentation, but this would be an exception to the rule explaining the why you want this field to be package and private. Because here Java is lacking a bit. We have no other way of expressing package and private but leaving it away. To give you a quick idea of why you would want to use package and private, for example, um, well, I'm from Munich, right? So, and I drive a BMW. And obviously my BMW needs an inspection from time to time. Now, if I make this method public, might not be the best idea, right? Because now everyone in the whole world can run an inspection on my car. And I know nothing about cars. <laughs> so I wouldn't even know what they do. So this is why I would better trust like a BMW engineer to do run the inspection for me. So this would be a case where we could make this method package in private. And then if we have the BMW class and a BMW package, not only the BMW engineer can access this method. So this would be one example where I would use package and private. OK. So now I want to finish my talk talking about coupling and cohesion. These really, I think, are the big guys to achieve a clean architecture. Let's see why. OK. So first, we'll start with coupling. This is like a short talk, topic is big, so I will just assume you know about coupling, right? So I will not go in all the details, really be a bit more quick here. So we have tight coupling and loose coupling. We try to achieve a loosely coupled system, like here we can see on the right side, and we try to avoid a tightly coupled system, like here. We can see that the tightly coupled system has lots of connections, right? I mean, this again obviously is the worst case, a big ball of mud. Everything is connected with everything else. While here we have like the perfect case. The system is just perfectly modeled exactly like the process we want it to look like. We can again reason about of how the system is working. Everything is going up to that green circle, whatever that is, seems like this is the important thing, right? Well, here we can hardly reason about anything. So this makes it really hard to understand, reason about, test, or implement, or maintain the system. So obviously, tight coupling is bad. And it seems like tight coupling is about many connections. But coupling is way more than that. 
I try to visualize that by making this very strong solid lines and here thin dotted lines. What I want to visualize with that is the strength of the connection. Because you can have two components on any level and the question is how do they communicate? And that does make a difference to how tightly they are coupled. And I want to illustrate this point a bit further. Okay, so the coupling strengths. So again, I read books that are even like 40 years old, so there's books only on that topic, so you could talk, I guess, weeks on only the strengths of the coupling. So here's only three short examples of what the strengths of the coupling is all about. And the first that I want to talk about is the type of the coupling. Okay, in this case, the question is, if we have two components, what kind of data are they exchanging? How many data is being sent and or received? And how complex is this data, right? Are we just sending one simple string? Well, that would be a very loose form of coupling, right? Or are we sending many parameters and very complex parameters? We could think of a very large collection of very complex objects. Well, obviously, the more data that is being sent and or received, the more complex and the more tighter our coupling gets. Obviously, there is a balance. I mean, we are not in Wonderland. We have to implement a business solution, right? So we, there are some limitations. But still, this is, again, not the whole truth. We have some flexibility. We can discuss it with the business people, and we have to. And we have to find ways of how we can make the coupling here looser. This is also on a class level, on a method level, why we would want to have methods that have really only few parameters. This will make everything simpler, and that will also make the coupling more looser. Okay. So, the next thing that I want to talk about in relation to the strengths of the coupling is the distance of the components. The question is, where are we in our hierarchy? Are we on the very low level, like here on the methods level? Or are we on the highest level here on the modules level? That again will make a difference. Well, first of all, obviously, we'll always strive for a loose form of coupling. But sometimes, as I'll show you in the next slides, a very loose form of coupling may come at a price. And there we have to, again, make a decision. Achieving a clean architecture is never black and white. It's always about making informed decisions. So it's never easy, right? And when we have to make a, such a decision, we have to take into account where are we. If we are on the modules level, this means there will be more developers involved usually and more code involved. And the more code is involved and the more people are involved, things get more complex. And we have to fight that complexity, right? Again, this is a social topic, obviously, right? Because we have to talk with more developers, this gets more difficult and this gets more uh, dangerous. So we have to uh, somehow deal with that. And this is why on such a high level, we would strive towards a very loose form of coupling. But on a methods level, for example, there's just one developer working on that and everything is simple and clean, it's probably okay if the coupling is a bit more tighter. Let's see this more in detail, okay. For example, here we have two components and they're exchanging data. This would be the sender, this would be the receiver. So the sender is sending something to, let's call it a message queue, and the receiver picks that up. Now the cool thing is, in this case, they are decoupled in time. The sender can send the data anytime, and the receiver, as soon as obviously the queue is full, can receive the data anytime. If there's a problem in sending or receiving, the sender can send the data again, and the receiver can receive the data again. That adds a lot of cool flexibility. That's why we like message queues, right? Cool, let's use that. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's not black and white, right? That message queue, it is simple, yes, we can do that, but it adds some complexity. And I have to say that again, as a clean coder, I really have zero tolerance for complexity. I really have to ask myself, we have to ask ourselves, do we really need that? And if we don't need that, why would we want to add that extra amount of complexity? If we are on a high level, let's say back to the microservices, right? There, decoupling them might be a great idea. But I wouldn't use this all the time just for two stupid, simple methods to, uh, to let me look smart, right? <laughs> it's not supposed to just make us look smart. It should be simple, and it should just be super simple and understandable and, and not complex, okay? So we shouldn't just use something because, okay? To give you a second example, 
Here, I put two, now the question is, can you see that? I put two components, again, I'm using a lot of colors always to make, I hope this makes it simpler. So the, in case you don't see this, both is blue, but it's not the same tone. This is important, you know, it's not the same blue. So, so the story is we have two small components, let's say two small methods. They are very much alike, they're very close from the functionality, but they're not the same, two different methods. But they use the exact same functionality, visualized here as the black dot down here. So we're duplicating code, we are violating the principle of dry. Well, that is evil, we shouldn't do that, right? That is a problem. So let's fix that. Ta-da, fixed, cool. Yeah. <laughs> but wait a sec, now we have a new problem. We have coupled these two methods. And now the question is, right, this is the balance. That, that is what we have to think about. Is this a problem or not? And there is no yes and no answer. This is, we have to make a decision specifically on the specific case. Now let's say in this case, everything is simple and clean, as I said, same blue color, very close to each other, Tests nice, everything good, so it's okay, let's do that. But let's assume we have a different case. Here we have many components, and let's assume I also use strong different colors here to say they're really very far apart from each other. And let's assume we're speaking of modules or even microservices. Now in this case, it might not be so wise to share all this code. So obviously, if we not share this code, we have to duplicate it. And developers really don't like duplicating code. But if we don't duplicate this code in this case, this has other consequences. If we again go to a domain-driven design, we would speak of maybe they are in different bounded contexts. And if they are in different bounded contexts, that functionality that is black here, that might look the same, and might even be the same right now, because this is also a matter of time, because things change over time, and here, each component can change at different times for different reasons. So even if this once was the same thing, it might not be the same thing in the future. And if we couple them all together, this can really be a pain in the, hmm, yeah. <laughs> and this is why, in this case, it might be not so wise. I mean, I'm not saying we shouldn't, this totally depends. That's all I'm saying, you know, we have to make a decision. Okay. So, and the last thing regarding the strengths of the coupling is the timing of the coupling. The question here is, if we have two components, how are they coupled? Are they coupled at compile or at runtime? Well, obviously, the later they are coupled, the cooler, the more flexibility we have. We all love something like dependency inversion, right? But this, again, adds complexity. And complexity and clean code, they don't go well together. So if we couple something at runtime, for example, in the latest case on production, if there is a problem in this coupling between the two components, we might see this problem happening only on production. And that might be really a severe problem. So when we use something like dependency inversion, again, we have to make an informed decision. Not just using that because it's cool, but because we know the consequences, we know the price, and we need this, and we can bear with the consequences. So in the case of our hexagonal architecture before, we had the different layers. There I would use, obviously, dependency inversion, because this will perfectly allow us to decouple the two layers and keep them apart. But I wouldn't use this everywhere and every time. We have to make informed decisions to achieve a clean architecture. Okay. So, now the last point, and the most important one. And that is cohesion. So what is cohesion? I asked this question because I talked to, again, some developers, and I found out many don't really know what cohesion is. But when I speak about um, something like the single responsibility principle, like 95% of the developers have heard. So who knows about the single responsibility principle? And who knows about cohesion? Okay, some, but less. I see this is less. Okay, so that's my point. Less people know about cohesion. The thing is, actually, it's pretty much, pretty much the same thing. Single responsibility was coined in 2002. Cohesion was coined about 60 years ago. Cohesion is the same thing on all levels. Single responsibility is about the responsibilities of a class, of a single class, like the functionalities, the responsibilities of a class. What does it do? 
cohesion does the same thing on all the levels. But I have a problem with that thing, single responsibility, because I never really again understood what is a single responsibility. Driving a car, is that a single responsibility? Well, it depends. It depends on the abstraction level. And that, I think, is better understood when we talk about cohesion, at least to me. Okay. But now I hope it's clear what cohesion is, right? And again, I try to visualize that with colors. So here in our highly cohesive system, what we're trying to achieve, everything is nicely sorted, right? Nicely organized. So it seems like cohesion is about sorting, organizing, and structure. And when you think about this, isn't this exactly what architecture is all about? Architecture is the structure of our system. And this is why, to me, cohesion is really the cornerstone. It's pretty much close to what architecture is or should be about. And this is why cohesion is so important to get right. And assuming you get cohesion right, or assuming you don't get it right, you see, it's also closely related to coupling, actually. Because let's assume for this case, the blue color here represents car-related logic. Now let's assume this circle here is a wheel, that one might be a steering wheel, and here we might have an engine, right? So obviously they have to talk to each other. Now if this logic is spread over the entire system, obviously this comes with a lot of coupling. So getting cohesion right will also allow us to get coupling right, at least at a high percentage. Coupling is way more. This is why I talked a lot about the strengths of the coupling. So it would not be right or fair to say, just get cohesion right and everything will be good. No, it's not so simple. <laughs> but getting cohesion right will get you in the right direction by, let's say, I don't know, 80%, right? And then we can see, like, how do they communicate? Can we make this better? How uh, is the data being exchanged? Okay. So if you want to, like, focus on one thing, I would start with cohesion. That's why. Okay. So now, the big question now remains, how can we achieve that? How can we achieve a highly cohesive system? And I was thinking a long time about this question, and I was really hoping I could give you the answer, because I like small, simple, pragmatic answers, so I would want to give you first this, second, and third. Unfortunately, this is so complex and not so easy to explain, so let me at least explain you why it's not. Well, high cohesion is or should be related to the business. Right? Because obviously it's about sorting, so the question is how do we sort? My answer is we should always strive towards cohesion in a business way, domain-driven way, and that requires a lot of knowledge. It depends on the business that you're working in. And assuming you are the new girl or guy joining a company, well, this company might exist for hundreds of years. The business might exist even for thousands of years, right? So if you join that new company, we would wish they put a large book on our desk, we can read this book, and two days later we know everything about the business. Well, unfortunately, it's not so easy. The thing is, this knowledge is spread over several sources. To make this worse, this knowledge is spread over several people. And this knowledge is the sacred value of those people. There is people that might be working in the company for, let's say, 10 years. Now, you're approaching them, and you want them to give you the knowledge. But why would they do so, right? This is their sacred value. So you have to make them your friends. You have to give them a reason to share this knowledge with you. This is their goal. This is their value, right? So this, again, is a very social topic. Super hard. And to make this worse, I mean, it's not that there is just one person that you can ask. There's several persons. And there will be disagreements. So you have to discuss. You have to argue. You have to find solutions. You have to, this is, this is not easy, right? And then again in the team, it's the same thing. You have to discuss this. So this itself is already difficult, but I will make it even worse. The thing is, this is again a matter of time. Because assuming the business you're working in, I would hope it's successful, right? And if it is successful, well, the world changes, so the business has to change. So this is a moving target. As soon as the business is changing, our code has to change. And just assuming you got this perfectly right, I would doubt if you ever got it, but let's just assume you got this perfectly right, then the business changes, ta-da, and it's not so clean as it was before. So this requires constant work, constant passion, every single day, like shaping our bodies. It's not enough to do this once, happy, happy, and we're good. 
No, this requires constant work, and this is not easy. This requires a lot of social skills, this requires a lot of deep knowledge about the business you're working in. So this is the hardest to get right, but this is the only way to achieve really a truly clean architecture. Okay. So now, I want to close my talk with this quote from David Parnas. He said, let me read this for you. I would advise students to pay more attention to the fundamental ideas rather than the latest technology. The technology will be out of date before they graduate. Fundamental ideas never get out of date. Okay, thank you. Now, I have time for questions. And before you leave, remember, there are stickers that you can pick if you like, a sticker like this guy here. But there's three different ones. Just be fair and don't take too many because others also would want to have a sticker maybe. Okay. Any questions? Yes, Richard? Uh, you talked about... Hello. Uh, you talked about using Java 9 modules as an approach to encapsulating a hexagonal architecture. Yes. Is this a project you've tried, uh, an approach you've tried on many projects? And if so, can you maybe explain some more of the details about that? No, this? I'm sorry. This is quite new. So I have not. I have played around with this. But like, if you're speaking of a really like, project in a big business, I have not so, because we're still on Java 8. Because that, again, you know, <laughs> is the reality that we, we have these ideas. But if the business has also certain needs, we cannot go so fast, yeah. Okay, if there's no questions, then thanks. Thanks for having me.